Amen. Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. That's awesome. That was very energetic from somewhere over there. That was a lot of fun. So my name is Lee. I'm the college pastor here at Cornerstone. It's so good to be here with you today. Uh, Before we get going, though, I want to say happy birthday to Rusty Hudson, our senior pastor here at Cornerstone. Rusty turned 27 today. He asked me not to make a big deal out of it, so we're just going to carry on in our morning. So Rusty, happy birthday. We're so incredibly grateful for everything you do here at Cornerstone Church. Today, we are going to be wrapping up a a series that we've titled Covenant and Kingdom. We've been looking at these two ideas of God's dealing and working with his people for all of time and how all throughout scripture and all of the stories of the Bible that we read, we read either one or both of these kind of threads working through God's covenant relationship with his people or his kingdom being brought here into this place into this world through his working through his covenant people. So we're going to wrap this up today. We are going to also start in Luke chapter 3. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn there right now, now would be a good time to do that. Um, If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, we have lots that we would love to give away. So you can stop at the information desk on the way out uh, and snag one of those on the way. Luke chapter 3 is where we're going to be. We're talking about covenant and kingdom. We're looking at these two ideas. And I have to be honest with you guys, much of covenant and kingdom is becoming reality in my life because I now have a child. So if you don't have a child, bear with me. Kind of try to put yourself there in the future um, if, if you're a student still, uh, if you're a college student, or if you're a high school student, or if you're a young unmarried person. Just kind of go with me here. I didn't really fully understand the reality or the gravity of what it meant for God to enter into a covenant with his people. And much of what God is teaching me about my identity has everything to do with my daughter's identity. And so I kind of joke with people all the time of how I'll look at Finley at four months old and I'll tell her, Stay. And if I take a picture of her, she stays. But for the most part, she's constantly, constantly moving. But what I've realized is that it doesn't matter if she's awake 17 times in the middle of the night or if she sleeps all the way through the night because we have no rhyme or rhythm. And for you people who have a baby that sleeps through the night at week one, I don't really want to talk to you right now. That's not necessarily our reality. But what I've come to understand is that my relationship with her, my love for her has absolutely nothing to do with what she does and everything to do with who she is. And so God is completely kind of transforming for me how I look at covenant relationship with him. And so this morning, we're gonna be in Luke chapter three. We're looking at Jesus's baptism and his kind of coming out of that in the, in the ministry that he would do thereafter. So chapter three, verse 21, we read this. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus begins his ministry with a very clear expression of covenant, a very clear expression of God setting his love on him. Heaven opens, the spirit descends in bodily form like a dove, and we don't really know what that looks like or how that actually came about. That's just how the gospels record it. This incredible union between heaven and earth in and on the person of Jesus by the spirit of God. And the father speaks, you are my son, my beloved son. With you am I pleased. With you do I take delight in. And we know and believe that from there, Jesus goes into the desert and he's tempted for 40 days. And he withholds or withstands the temptation from the enemy. And he passes all of the tests. And then for the rest of his earthly ministry, he remembers those words, you are my son whom I love with you. I am pleased. Later in John, Jesus tells his disciples, I represent the father. That when you see me, you see the Father. And this is an incredibly um, dangerous thing to say in a Jewish world, but also an incredibly pointed thing for us to remember and to look at in the life of Jesus. Is not only does he receive the love of the Father and rest in who he is as he does everything that he does, but he also recognizes and remembers and is always aware of the fact that I represent my Father, the King. When you see me, you aren't really seeing me, you're seeing the Father. So we have these two things. We have covenant, very much wrapped up in the idea that Jesus always, always, always remembers his identity. 
that he's constantly resting in who he is, but he's also always remembering that he represents someone much, much, much bigger than himself in his earthly ministry here on earth. We have covenant, I am the son of God. You are a daughter, you are a son of God covenant relationship, but we also have kingdom that for those of us who claim to be Christians, those who would come after Christ, that we also bear the same responsibility that he did in terms of representing his father. And everything that Jesus does for all of his ministry is constantly in that vein or through that lens of, I represent my father. I represent the one who has sent me. I represent the one who is redeeming the world to himself. And throughout Jesus' life, when we look at all of the stories, all of the healing, all of the teaching, all of the, the coming and bringing back, we never see condemnation. We are constantly looking at a savior, at a son of God who comes into this world completely focused on redeeming and restoring and healing and touching and bringing wholeness where there is brokenness. We never see a list of rules. We never ever really see Jesus saying, if you do X, Y, and Z, then you will be a son. Then, once you're a son or a daughter because you've done these things, then you can represent my father in heaven. We see none of that. We see Jesus time and time again reaching out to the hurt and to the broken. But we also see Jesus time and time again looking at the unrepentant, looking at those who are choosing to live their life for their gain and for their kingdom. And Jesus says these words. He says, how often would I have gathered your children under my wings like a, like a mother hen gathers her brood or her chicks? How often would I have gathered your chicks together under my wings, but you were not Willing. Jesus sees a people of God who have forgotten that they are the people of God, and he weeps over them while constantly bringing the sick and the lost and the hurting. And so what we see when Jesus tells his disciples that I represent the Father, when you see me, you see him, and then at the same time, Jesus is doing all of these things but bringing people back to himself, of constantly telling them, this is what it means to rest in your identity. What we're seeing there is the Father speaking through his Son, saying, this is what I desire, relationship with you. I desire for you to come home. I desire for you to remember who you are. Forget about the rules. Forget about your own glory. Forget about your own kingdom. Forget about climbing the ladder. Forget about all of those things and remember who you are. This is the, the, the mission that Jesus finds himself on. This is the, question, or the thing that he was constantly asking his disciples of, won't you remember this? And the same question is very pertinent for us today is, Will you rest in who you are and whose you are? And won't you live from that place? And the question, we have several questions for us this morning, but the first one is, are you living your life today in 2013 in light of this? Because I'll be honest with you, oftentimes I find myself pursuing my own kingdom or trying to earn a relationship. But the reality for me is that God has reached in and through his son and touched me and healed me in a way that I can't explain that the gospel has completely flipped everything that I thought I was going to be doing with my life upside down and has said, really, it's not about you, it's about me and my glory, so won't you go and represent me, your father? But I think the bigger question that we constantly wrestle with is it's not necessarily whether we believe this, but how do we do this? How do we maintain this type of relationship that we know and believe full well that God has called us into? And so this morning, we're gonna look at Jesus introducing himself to Paul. We're going to look at just how and that, how exactly Jesus explains to Paul how we are to maintain this type of covenant kingdom relationship, this covenant and kingdom identity that we are called to as believers. So we're going to flip over to Acts chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be there for the rest of the morning. Acts chapter 9. Uh, the church is being persecuted at this point. There are many in Jerusalem who are being killed for the gospel. They are being threatened. They are being attacked time and time again. They are being uh, dragged off to prison. The high priests are constantly pointing to them saying, you will not preach in this name. You will not testify in this name. And this is right before, or this comes right after uh, Philip has converted the Ethiopian on his way back to Africa. So this is in chapter 9 where Saul, who has been uh, really the instigator of much of the church's problems at this point, Saul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. So we pick up in uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, meaning meanwhile all these people were being threatened, meanwhile Saul 
was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light fell from heaven and flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. So Paul, blinded on the road to Damascus, hears this voice, this blinding light. He falls to the ground. And Jesus speaks to him and said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, having really no idea what's going on or who this person is, asks who he is. Who he is. So Jesus then repeats himself and says, I am Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? And then Paul immediately is told to get up and go into town. He goes into Damascus and he spends three days fasting, blind, weeping. Who knows what kind of conversations he was having with himself or with God or, or how that interaction was going. But he sits there for three days until Ananias shows up. God comes and speaks in his spirit to Ananias. and He says, go and tell brother Paul. Go and tell him where he must go and what he must do and who I am. Go and preach the gospel to this person who has been persecuting you. So Ananias, reluctantly, obviously, because this is the guy that's been throwing Christians into jail at the hands of the Roman government and with the authority of the Jewish council, and he goes to him and he tells him, brother, he calls him brother. He says, brother Saul, you've been doing all of these things, you've been doing all of this, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus, the Son of God, is here to heal you today. And Paul receives forgiveness, something like scales, scripture says, falls off of his eyes. Paul then stands up, he's baptized, And then he spends the rest of his life, the rest of his life sharing the gospel with those who were outside of the Jewish nation. He spends the rest of his life focused on much of Asia and Italy and Rome, north and west of Jerusalem. He shares the story of a Jewish rabbi to a non-Jewish people that if they would believe and turn from their wayward life, if they would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he offers healing, he offers wholeness, he offers restoration, he offers everything that you've been looking for in this world in one single person, that if they would turn and believe in him, that they would come to healing, they would come to salvation. But the point of us looking at Paul's interaction with Jesus on the Damascus road is not so much about Paul's ministry afterwards, but it's about what I want to look at this morning in terms of how we as a people maintain our covenant relationship with God. I want us to look very specifically at what Jesus says to Paul. He says on the road after he's blinded him, why are you persecuting me? Paul responds very naturally with, I have no idea who you are. Who are you, Lord, Paul says. And then Jesus repeats himself, and he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So he says it in two different ways, that in all that Paul has been doing, even though Paul has never met Jesus, that he has no idea what he really looks like except for stories, and who knows what kind of stories were made about Jesus in the days after he was born, probably something like William Wallace tales or whatever the case is, of just this person who healed all of these people. But he doesn't know him personally. He's never heard his voice. And Jesus tells him twice in a matter of seconds, why have you been persecuting me? I am Jesus whom you have been persecuting. And and what Jesus is doing here is he's telling Paul, but also all of us who would come after and read this story, that there is something incredibly unifying between Jesus and his disciples when they become his disciples. That when God even enters into covenant with a people, that now in that moment you are no longer yourself. Paul uses this language over and over throughout his letters of you are no longer your own, you were bought with a price. Your old man was gone and now you are united in Christ. This time and time and time again of speaking of the covenant bringing a union between that person and their God in an inseparable way. And Jesus is telling Paul here on the road to Damascus that when you hurt a single one of my disciples, when you hurt any of them, you are attacking Me, personally. There is this incredibly mystical, unexplainable union that happens for a believer when he becomes one 
with Christ. And in the same way that the Father and the Son were one at Jesus' baptism and the Spirit descends on him, there is an incredibly unifying thing that happens for a believer in the Spirit when we believe in faith that Jesus is the Son of God and we repent and turn from our sins. Jesus says, I feel those who are covenanted with me. Those who have entered into a relationship with me, I am now connected to them. They are part of me now. Paul spent the rest of his life on the flip side of the persecution. He spent much of his early years attacking the church, and then he spent years upon years upon years of being beaten for the gospel. And he knows it's coming. Like time and time again, right, he'll say things like, I know that nothing but persecution awaits me in this city. But it's because the Spirit told him, I'm going to show you all that you have to suffer for my name. This is a little bit later on in Acts, in chapter 9. Ananias tells him all that will come after he becomes a believer. But over time, as God is being, as, as, as God leads Paul into situations where he's being beaten and whipped and lashed and shipwrecked and all of these things and then beaten again and lashed and then kicked out of town, over and over and over again, he is showing him all of the things that he must suffer. And over time, Paul starts to develop this analogy of what it means to be part of Christ, what it means to be covenanted with Christ, what it means to be in relationship with him is that you are now part of his body. That as a person of God who has now been brought into a relationship, you are no longer solo. You are no longer on your own. You are now forever and completely intertwined in the life of Christ with Jesus as the head of his body. And I think it probably took Paul time to really understand what he was talking about, but this is an incredibly clear picture for us now as we read scripture and for us now as we look at the church and as we look around here at Cornerstone Church on Sunday mornings, regardless of what sites you worship at on a regular basis, that we are a body of believers here that are part of the body of Christ. An incredible oneness that happens for us when we are united in Christ is we are now intimately and forever connected to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he says, when you believe in me, you live in me. When you come to me, when you live in me, you are now part of my body. When you are part of my body, you know the Father as I know the Father because you are now connected to him through me in the same way that Jesus was connected to his Father by his Spirit. And in the same way that the father looked at his son on the day of his baptism and said, you are my son whom I love. The father looks at each and every one of us who are covenanted with him through his son and by his spirit and says, you are my son whom I love. In the case of Paul's persecution, he's telling him, when my people hurt, I hurt. When my people hurt, are beaten. When my people are broken, I hurt for them. I feel it. I know what it's like to feel what you feel. But that's covenant on one side of the page. That's Jesus knowing what it is like to feel and be connected with and be united to his people. But the flip side for us is that we are also covenanted to him as well. And as covenant members of his family, we now, sitting in relationship with him, we now bear an incredibly magnificent and mind-blowing, and I don't understand it and think I ever will, kind of a relationship with him, where we represent him in this world. Paul says that we are ambassadors. We are the ones who go on behalf of. We are the ones who share the good news. We are the ones that because of the spirit inside of us and our union with Jesus, we are the ones that carry the good news to a broken and hurting world. And in the same way that when people touched Jesus and and, and healing and wholeness and restoration and freedom came into their lives, we as the covenant people of God carry the same power. We carry the same power authority because Jesus himself lives inside of us. And I think it's pretty telling that so oftentimes we forget that. At least for me personally. I don't know if you've ever done this, but so oftentimes I will find myself about middle of the week realizing that I've spent the entire week doing things on my own. All on my own power and completely forgetting about the fact that I bear an incredible responsibility. But what an amazing privilege at the same time 
to carry the name of Jesus everywhere I go. And there's an incredibly freeing thought to that, but there's also an incredibly daunting side to that, that if we sit there long enough, we'll go, oh, good gosh. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea how to do that. I have no idea what it means to be, for me to bear a message of freedom in my workplace where everyone kind of walks around like this and then goes back and they, can, they continue doing their job. I have no idea what it means for me to bear witness in that kind of place. But the beautiful thing for you and I is that so oftentimes, because whether we want to admit it or not, we're an incredibly prideful people. I'm prideful, you're prideful. We are constantly worried about what we look like, how people are gonna perceive us. If I share this with that person, what are they gonna think of me? Is that gonna hurt my chances of getting to go to the lake with them? Or whatever the case is for you, I don't know. There's, we're constantly thinking of things that affect us. But the good news for us is that in, even in light of our pride, that Jesus never intended you or I to do this alone. That God spent so many years forming this image of the body of Christ and speaking it through his servant, Paul. He spent all of that time teaching that through him to the early church so that we today would be able to gather and very nonchalantly at times and very forgetting about what it really means, say that we are part of the body of Christ. We are now united not only to the king of the universe, but we are forever covenanted to one another. You can represent Jesus because he has saved you, but you can never represent Jesus as he intended you to alone. This is why at Cornerstone, you will hear us time and time again talk about the absolute critical importance of being a member of a church. And the truth is, whether you're here or you're in another church, we would love for you to be here, but wherever you find yourself, if you are not connected in covenant with a people, with a body of believers, then you are not representing Jesus the way that he fully intends you to because you and I individually are not capable of doing this perfectly. That at some point I am going to fail to represent Jesus to my wife. I'm going to fail to teach my daughter as I should about what it means to know and walk with Christ. I am going to mess this up. Just me being honest with you guys. But God, in his sovereignty, in his ultimate and infinite wisdom, says, I have covenanted you to myself. I have bought you. I have redeemed you. I have literally paid the price for you and brought you to myself. But I've also done that with all of these other people. And now, here you are, gathered in this place. Won't you bear witness to my name together? And won't you take courage that you are not alone? Won't you look around at the people you are sitting next to and realize that you together, through the Spirit of God, bear the name of God to the entire world. In the same way that feet are no good without legs. In the same way that my hand can't fully function without its arm. You and I have to have one another. As much as my pride would like to do this alone and I'd like to take all the credit for it, we'd all say that at some point. As much as I would love to do that, God in his incredibly infinite wisdom has said, no, that's not the way. So the, the tough question for us today, for us to answer wholeheartedly, individually, but then also corporately, I think we have to ask this question at a bigger level, but for you personally sitting here this morning, is if you bear this type of relationship between you and the creator of the universe. And if God intended you for, for you to share that with everyone you came into contact with, the question is, are people being touched by, seen by, loved by, and, well, loved by, the ruler of the universe when they see you, when you touch them, when you enter into their life? And if the answer is no, or I don't know, or I'm really concerned if that's actually the case, then one or two things has probably happened. You've either forgotten your covenant relationship with Christ, meaning you're trying to do it on your own, you're forgetting who you are, you're trying to earn the love of the Father, or you've forgotten that you bear the image and the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and your responsibility is for all of your life to bear witness to his name. That's often where I find myself. 
For a long season of my life, I spent so much time trying to earn the love of the Father, and then God has kind of shaped me in that. But now I find myself time and time again pursuing my own kingdom and not his. I find myself chasing after things that never satisfy me the way that my Father can and does. So we have been invited into relationship with the Father. We have been invited into a a covenant identity that says, you are my son, you are my daughter, whom I love. It is freely given. It's completely undeserved. In much the same way that I love Finley just because she's Finley, in the same way the Father looks at you and I and says, you are my son, my daughter, whom I love, I freely give you that. But you now bear my name. Your last name is no longer Cadden. Your last name is actually my name. You represent me and all that you do and all of your life is to be spent bringing me glory, bringing me fame. So we're in relationship with him but we're also given a responsibility to represent him but we are not hermits. We are not called to be isolationists. We are called to do this together as the body of Christ walking together in unity so that when I mess up, you pick me up and when you fail, I gently lead you back into grace. When all of those things happen, we are pushing one another. It's why we hold small groups highly. It's why we hold discipleship highly. It's why we are constantly talking about who are you doing life with because if you're on your own, you're going to fail because it's going to become about you at some point or another. We've been covenanted to the Father. We've also been covenanted together as the body of Christ. Are we living that way? Are we showing people the love of Christ as the body of Christ? Are we constantly pointing people back to the Father? Are we pointing people to ourselves or are we pushing people away from both? Jesus has called us into relationship with himself and he says, it doesn't really matter what you do. I think we spend so much time focused on what we do in this life. So many conversations that I have with college students on a regular basis is really wrapped around two things. What am I gonna do for the rest of my life and who am I gonna spend it with? Spend all of college trying to figure out where you're gonna go and what you're gonna do and who am I gonna marry and who am I gonna do it with? But the reality is, is Jesus is saying, listen, it doesn't really matter what you do or where you go. Yes, I have specific things that I've called you to and the specific things that I've gifted you in. But if you don't rest in who you are, if you don't recognize the responsibility that you've been given as a son or as a daughter, then you're never going to do construction well. Then you're never going to live as a husband or a father as I have called you to if you don't rest in who you are first. Christian, this is why, this is why you exist. This is why God has brought you to himself. This is why he has saved you, for his glory. And as the church, our entire mission, everything we do, whether it be here in this body or it be in Biloba or it be in Asia or it be wherever you find yourself, You are called to be covenanted to a group of people carrying the name of Jesus together. Always, always, always bringing him the glory. And so my prayer for us this morning is that that we would not be a people who are Christian in name only, but that we would be a people who are Christian in the way we live, love, act, work, play, everything we do. That Jesus would be glorified because of it and that at the end of the day we individually and collectively would live lives worthy of the calling that we have received live your life worthy of the gospel knowing that you can't do it alone you were never intended to and you're not here on accident let's pray Jesus, we believe that throughout history, by your spirit, you have been rescuing, you have been redeeming, you have been buying back that which was lost. You have been saving a people to yourself so that that people 
would then go and share with the entire world what it means to be free, what it means to be loved, what it means to be fully satisfied. Father, we confess that so oftentimes we have chosen to live outside of our identity, that we choose so oftentimes to, to run to things that never fill us. This morning, I pray that we would rest in our identity, that we would rest in the fact that we are sons and daughters of God, and that from that place, we would spend all of our life, all of our life, bringing you glory. Lord, we confess that so oftentimes we choose to do this on our own, but you have so perfectly brought us into relationship with other people by your spirit. And we don't claim to have it all figured out here at Cornerstone Church, but we do know and believe that this body of believers is on mission together to lead people to know and serve Jesus. And that is no small task. But we thank you that it is by your grace, your power, and your authority that you lead us, that you are doing the work through us. We love you so very much. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be part of your family. And we pray that, Lord, we would live that way, that you would give us the strength and the courage to bear your name as you so rightly deserve. We love you this morning, Lord. We will continue to sing to you and lift our praises to you. I pray that this summer would be a summer of pursuing you, Jesus, of not sitting back on our heels, but it would be a time where we rest in our identity and we spend all of our life working for you and for your kingdom and for your glory, Jesus. Amen.